as we make small incremental changes, your child is going to change by leaps and bounds. This is episode 110. We welcome you to the ADHD Smarter Parenting Podcast. Here to heal and elevate lives is your parenting coach, C.O.P. Kinney Kinney. Hello, my friends. Welcome. Thank you for joining me today. I am so excited about the topic that we will discuss during this time together. So wherever you may be, driving around, running errands, cleaning your house, I need you to pay attention to what we will be discussing today because we are covering anxiety, ADHD, and using the ABCs of behavior. Now, at the end of this podcast, you should be able to do three very specific things. First, you're going to learn how to manage your own anxiety about your child's anxiety and in turn, how your child can manage their own anxiety. Second, you're going to be able to identify moments when you and your child can intervene to address anxiety using the ABCs of behavior. And then the third thing is how to document, how to plan and deal with anxiety as it comes. So throughout their day, have a plan in place so your child can deal with what's happening. Now, it's important for you to understand that children with ADHD also struggle with other issues and anxiety tends to be a huge one. So a child may present with having a lot of ADHD, put them in a classroom, and that elevates their anxiety, their need to perform in a very specific way. And it may cause a lot of discomfort and a lot of problems in the classroom. This also happens at home or other places where there's a lot of structure. Kids may start to feel anxious about those situations and what they need to do. Now, during this course, I will be sharing with you also an example from a family that I have been working with in dealing with anxiety and ADHD. So it's super important for you to pay attention to what we're going to be doing. Now, I wanted to start off by having you get into a state where you are relaxed, where you are calm. So we're going to do an exercise together. Now, don't turn the channel. Don't don't flip through because this is going to be helpful for you. You have to be able to experience what it's like to move from one state into another state in order to explain it to your child and for your child to do it. The whole teaching family model is about the parents being able to model the appropriate behavior for their children. And so you have to be the example. In fact, you're going to model what you want your child to do. And in turn, your child is going to be able to adapt and adopt what you're doing. So we're going to do this relaxation technique. Now, if you're someone who struggles with anxiety, this will be very helpful for you. What I want you to do right now is I want you to take your tongue, put it on the roof of your mouth, and I want you to let your tongue fall to the bottom of your mouth. I want you to open your mouth slightly so your jaw is just a little bit lower and there's you can have some air in and out of your mouth. Now I want you to move your jaw from left to right, just slightly. We're loosening up to the jaw. Okay, great. Good job. Okay, as you do that, I need you to close your eyes, take your hands, and I want you to stroke outward from your eyebrow. So you're going to start on the inside of your eyebrow and lightly stroke it outside, just relaxing your eyebrows. And then I need you to relax your eyes. Okay, good. Now, as we are in this state, I want you to imagine the emotion of joy and also imagine the emotion of sadness. With the emotion of joy, I want you to assign it a color, any color that you want. Joy has a color and sadness has a color. Okay, great. What we're going to do is we're going to take a breath in through our nose and we're going to breathe in the color of joy. And then we're going to hold it. And then as we breathe out through our mouth, we are going to breathe out the color of sadness. Okay. So here we go. We're going to do it three times. Deep breaths. Breathe in. Through the nose. We're going to hold it. One, two, three. Breathe out through the mouth. 
Breathe in. Hold. One, two, three. Breathe out. Breathe in. Get all the color in your body. Let it feel all over. Hold. Breathe out. Deep breath out of the sadness color. Okay, wonderful. Now open your eyes. That's a relaxation technique that you'll find a lot of professionals use with children in order to help them de-escalate or to help them calm down, to help them reset or change their overall state. Now, you should have felt some relaxation happening in your shoulders. You should have felt some relaxation happening in your overall body and a sense of elation in joy, the sensation of joy as you breathed in and as you breathed out. This exercise is one that I've used with children multiple times. In fact, the family that I'm working with right now, this is a technique that we use before we even start talking about anything because what I need them to do is to be in a state where I can communicate and they can communicate where they're relaxed and they're calm. So this is an example of something that you can try with your child. So we've done it together. Now you know what it sounds like. You know what it feels like because you did it. In a way, we role-played it, which is one of the big components of the teaching family model. And now you can practice this with your child. Now, of course, you're going to use this when your child is calm. So you're going to teach this at a time when your child can learn it and learn it well, and they can have that whole sensation and shift in their mood. So when the time comes and they start to have these anxiety attacks, when they're struggling to pay attention with ADHD, you can refocus them and say, okay, we're going to walk through what we've done before. You remember what happens. You're going to slow your rate of speech so they can pay attention and walk them through the whole process. And you'll find that they're going to be able to de-escalate some of the, the feelings of anxiety that they have. Now, this isn't the only technique that we have. So there are multiple techniques, and you can learn more of those techniques through our coaching because we have techniques that you can use as parents and things that you can teach your child and that we can practice with your child through a coaching session. So that's the first thing. We have to learn as parents to manage our own anxiety about our child's anxiety first. Then we model it the way that I did with you. And then you are going to take it and model it for your children. Have your children adopt and adapt to it so they know exactly what to do. It's a wonderful technique. It's a wonderful, wonderful technique. And with little children, they tend to like the idea of having colors. Now, I've done this with multiple children, and I've done it with adults as well. And what's interesting is everyone chooses very interesting colors. So you would think that a lot of people would choose happy colors for um, joy and for sadness. Strangely enough, I did this last night, and we had various different colors representing joy. So purple, blues. That was interesting to me because, you know, for me, my colors are orange. I love orange, and orange is a color of, of joy for me. I love the way oranges smell the fruit, and that makes me happy. So anyways... This idea of how we're associating some colors in there is going to be helpful also in the long run as we start to anchor our children into these concepts of, hey, we can access these states when we need to access them when we're starting to feel anxious. So that's the first part. Okay, so we've talked about learning to manage your own anxiety about your child's anxiety. We've done an exercise Understand that you as a parent are going to have to learn to manage how you respond to your child's anxious moods. And this may be a technique that you want to use when your child is acting out to calm yourself down and put yourself in a mood where you can actually help your child. We're going to talk now about identifying moments when you and your child can intervene to address anxiety using the ABCs of behavior. But before we do... We have a message for you. Hi, my name is Elizabeth. Did you know Smarter Parenting provides coaching services? We are here to meet your needs. If you need one coaching session a month or three coaching sessions a month, we can help you. 
Thanks to generous support, we can provide coaching services to families even on a tight budget. A personal coach to guide you through problems you're struggling with with your child. Visit the Smarter Parenting website and go to the coaching page for more information. Okay, welcome back. We are going to be discussing identifying moments when you and your child can intervene to address anxiety using the ABCs of behavior. Now, the ABCs of behavior is a concept that you can find on the Smarter Parenting website. The ABCs stand for specific words, antecedent for the A, behavior for the B, and the consequence for the C. All three of those are essential for you to understand when you're dealing with a child who struggles with anxiety or ADHD. Antecedent obviously means before. So you're going to be looking for things that happen before a behavior happens. Then you have your behavior, which is the anxiety response, and then you are going to look at the consequence afterwards. So what is the result of the behavior, good or bad? Now, as we lay this out, you are going to find that this is amazing because a lot of parents think that you only address the B area of a behavior. You can only address things in behavior. The reality is, is parents have a lot more flexibility if they approach a child's issues looking at things from the aspect of antecedent behavior and consequence. You can address a child's behavior before the behavior happens. You can also address the child's behavior after the behavior happens. So if your child is exhibiting some anxiety and they are acting out and throwing a tantrum, think to yourself this way. I'm not going to respond only when my child throws a tantrum. I'm going to evaluate and see what's happening before the tantrum behavior and see if there are things that I can teach my child before that even happens. And then after tantrum behavior, what am I going to do afterwards to teach my child to fix that behavior? Now, most parents are blown away by this concept because the idea that they can have this wider gamut of working with a child seems so amazing to them. They actually have a lot more flexibility in how they're going to parent and help their child become successful. Again, you can address a behavior before it happens. You can address a behavior while it happens. And you can also address the behavior after it happens. And by focusing on all three of those areas, you are going to be able to help your child really change a lot of the things that they are doing. You're going to set them up for success and you're going to give them the opportunity to realize, hey, I'm just not melting down for no reason. There are some things that are happening before. There's my behavior And if I can adjust things after the behavior happens, maybe it won't happen again, right? All in the preparation part of the work. The ABCs of behavior is very important for parents to understand. This whole concept of being able to address behaviors long before a behavior happens, when the behavior is happening, and after the behavior is amazing. So... We've talked about identifying moments when a behavior happens. Now, the important thing, and this is the third thing that I wanted to talk to you about, is documenting it, plan to deal with it. So as we look at the ABCs of behavior and we're looking at a very specific behavior that we're trying to address, let's say it's an anxiety-induced panic, okay? Let's look at what is happening before in most instances. A lot of times children develop these anxiety moods before they have to go to a place that may be uncomfortable. could be school, could be church, could be over to a friend's house that they really don't want to be at or, you know, regardless, whatever it may be, they may feel anxiety or they may have struggles. We have to evaluate, okay, what is happening before that behavior happens? And this is the example I'm going to share with the family that I've been working with. I'm not going to use their names. I'm going to change their names to protect their identity, of course, out of respect for them. But we will call the mom, Roseanne, and and her daughter who is struggling with anxiety. We're going to call her Stephanie. So Roseanne has been working with Stephanie, who is young. 
uh, roughly around 10, 11 years old, Roseanne has high anxiety about being in, out in public. As we looked at the ABCs of behavior, as Roseanne and I started working through ways that we can address the behavior, we started to notice a pattern. Any time that her mother would turn on the light and put out her clothes on the bed and start preparing her for the day in the morning, that's when the, the behaviors would happen. In talking with Roseanne, we, we came up with an idea that this was part of the triggering piece for her daughter in preparing for the day. And that's just to get up and go out the door, okay, for daycare. So, and for babysitting, because we're on lockdown and, and mom works and somebody has to watch, watch her. So we had to come up with a solution to that. And the solution was to, instead of just putting everything out on the bed and saying, okay, get ready, let's go, is to actually work with her in preparing her to go by being with her every step of the way. Now, this required a lot of work on mom's part. And I know that we like to do things that are easy and we expect our children to do things that we ask them to do. However, our children struggle, and especially now with lockdown. So we need to guide them and walk them through the whole process and actually be a lot more forgiving in the behaviors that they exhibit. So the idea was for the antecedent, because she knew she was going to go and leave the house, mom was going to prepare her in a much different way. Instead of turning on the lights and just putting out the clothes and saying, get up, get going, mom was going to gently wake her up and be there by her side as they prepared for the day. So they would prepare together for the day. And so we tried that. We tried that for a few days to see if there's any change in her behavior. Now, what we found was that she loved to get ready with her mom. She loved to be a part of this whole process of, hey, we're going to start our day. And then they started having issues when they were actually driving down the road after leaving the house. But mom was able to correct enough of the behaviors in the antecedent phase before the anxiety issues started to pop up previously by integrating something different at the beginning. So now we were having the behaviors later when they were driving down the road. Then we thought, okay, let's let's figure this out. Do we want to address the behavior as the behavior is happening, antecedent or consequence? And we chose again the antecedent. Let's see, what can we do before she starts to feel anxious as we're driving down the road? Well, one of the things was to be sure she had everything that made her feel comfortable, made her feel at home. We had things that brought her comfort, a picture that she could have of her parents. Um, and also we had her bring her favorite toy. We just kind of created this environment of guiding her along this process. We also taught her some calming down techniques that mom could do while she's driving and that her child could do on her own in the car. So we started to layer multiple things in order to help this child deal with this feeling of anxiety. And what we noticed was after a little while, the anxiety part of it didn't happen while they were getting ready in the morning like it had before and didn't carry into the car like it had before. Now it was during drop-off. So we had to figure out a way that we were going to address this. Now, as you can tell through this whole process, there are layers upon layers of ways that we can address behaviors. And so we were teaching her throughout this whole process how to calm down and how not to react in a negative way to the idea of leaving home and having to go somewhere for care when her mom went to work. But as we started to do this, it became easier and easier for her to calm herself down and to bring herself into a state. And soon she was suggesting things. So she wanted to bring in other things into where she was being cared for that she could keep there and she could have access to just things from home that made it feel like it was more of a home for her. So she would be more comfortable there. So we made the accommodations. Now, this is really the ideal situation that you want to be in as a parent. You want to focus on behaviors during the antecedent phase, because if you can change the behavior before the behavior happens, you're in a lot better spot than trying to deal with a behavior right in the middle of the behavior, right? This was fantastic. 
fantastic for Roseanne. She was able to change this whole trajectory of her child's mourning into something more positive, and we continue to work on having her deal with anxiety in multiple situations. Let me tell you the benefits of doing it this way. The benefits of doing it this way and having mom be so flexible to multiple situations is as her child grows, she's going to be able to adapt and adopt these methods to other areas of her life where she may feel anxious, where she may struggle. And so being able to help her now is going to pay off in the long run because mom will be able to just remind her, hey, this is what we can do to help you calm down. Remember, we practice this. We're going to do the same thing in this situation in the future. It may not be dropping off for daycare. It may be at school, maybe somewhere else. We are preparing her child for a better future by teaching her and modeling for her what she should be doing instead. It's amazing what we can do in such a short amount of time when we implement these concepts And when parents are able to recognize that we can do things in the antecedent part of a behavior, the behavior itself, or the consequence. Now, one of the things that I did recommend to Roseanne was that she document everything. So before we even started, I wanted her to document what was going on before the anxiety happened. And it had to go five hours before, based on the age of the child. Older children, it could be like a day before or three days before because they remember. But with her child, we only went five hours before. What's happening five hours before? And then we focused on what was happening before the behavior happened in order to know. I also had mom rate the level of anxiety her child was having, 10 being the most severe. So we started off at 8, and then as time went on, it it reduced down to 7, to 6, to 5. And it was manageable. Then we moved over to the car, had mom rate that as well so we could keep track. It's important for you to keep records because if you do not keep records, you cannot measure change. You can't measure the change that's happening. If you document it, then you have written proof that reminds you of, hey, okay, this is where we were This is where we need to be. This is why they recommend you write down your goals. It's important to write them down because once you write it down, it's a fixture. It's fixed and you can't go back and reevaluate and rejudge and change. So rate the level of anxiety your child is feeling when they are in that state and then measure if things are improving or not. You're going to find that by doing this, you can move a lot more quickly as well in addressing the behaviors. Most parents don't realize their children are making progress because their children are making small incremental changes, but parents don't recognize that and they think everything is just staying the same. The reality is, is once you introduce something new to your child, your child has to adapt. And by adapting, something is changing. So you need to document, you need to keep track. Now, we've covered quite a bit. The When we began this podcast, we started off with a relaxation technique that I definitely want you to continue to use. In fact, I want you to practice this in the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening, and then right before you go to bed. I also want you to teach this to your child. Now, I taught it to you, and we did it. Now, you're going to teach it to your child, and you are going to do it. With your child, you will need to do that relaxation technique that we practiced earlier more often for it to stick, and that's okay. So you want to help them learn these techniques on how to tell their body to calm down when they're dealing with anxious feelings, okay? I can't tell you what a powerful thing it is to be able to help a child make these changes. When children are able to make these changes, you start to notice them improving in so many other areas because you can't change one part of a child's system without changing the entire part. And as we make small incremental changes, your child is going to change by leaps and bounds. So I've seen it a million times. I'll see it a million times again. It's just the way it works. It's just the way it works. So... That's it for me. Thank you for joining me. Again, join us next week. Subscribe. Leave a rating on Apple. 
if you can for this podcast and share it with friends. We obviously are here to help you. That's it for me, and I will talk to you later. All right, see ya. Bye.